Hello, everyone, and welcome to this amazing book launch. I have now read this book, and I can tell you it's definitely worth reading. <laughs> so it's up here for all of you to look at. Um, just to make sure I've got the title right, Rethinking De Democratic Backsliding in Central and Eastern Europe is the topic of tonight. And um, it is, uh, I should put everyone in order, although I think it might be alphabetical. Licia Sinetti, James Dawson, Sean Hanley, and Ellie Knott has a contribution. All of the contributions are extremely strong, and that's unusual for a book of this kind. So um, it's a very, very theoretically deep book. Um, what I'm going to do is I, having read the book, will tell you all the amazing things about it, or at least a few, and I have a few questions just to get discussion going. Um, after I'm done, we'll hear from each of the panelists for about five minutes, um, and then we want to maximize discussion, so we'll open it up to the floor. We have the room until 8.30. I believe, so we can have a nice full discussion. I tell you that there's a lot in here, there's a lot to discuss, and we'd want to hear from you. Um, so I will start with a little autobiographical um, aspect. I was quite depressed reading this book because I'm of the generation that got interested in Eastern Europe in the 1990s. It was a very optimistic time. Things were going well, or so we thought. That will be a big theme. And I did find myself thinking, because the book is somewhat depressing if you are of that generation of scholars that joined at this optimistic time and you've had to, at least over the last decade, realize you had to let go of some of that optimism as long as you were following the empirics of the region. And I thought, would I want to study the region now as a graduate student? I don't know, because it's not very optimistic. But then we don't have optimism anywhere in the world, especially with climate change. So maybe it's OK to all become realists about some of the things we're facing on the ground in East and Central Europe, in the Balkans, the Baltics, because they're going to tell us a lot about politics generally, that perhaps we've been too optimistic in general about politics, and we need to take off the rose-colored glasses and see what's actually happening. Um, in that sense, this book has a lot of lessons for politics in general. Now, um, my supervisor in this 1990s journey to get my PhD was Charles Tilley, and he wrote about democracy, and I think he did something that we can use now, that at the time I thought was a bit pessimistic. But rather than think about democracy in a 2007 book as a trajectory going in one direction, he thought about it more like something like this. So I don't remember the gra exactly what was on each axis, but the process of democracy always goes back and forth, and you never really know where you will end up. And this, I think, was the trajectory of France over a few hundred years. This is the kind of thing he liked to do. This is not exactly backsliding. This is around sliding. It shows that there's a lot more going on. So Tilly knew this in 2007, and it's something we can think about now. Um, and I think it's a good kind of way to start out a discussion of this book, because while backsliding is in the title, it problematizes backsliding, which I thought was kind of a cheeky thing to do, but we'll get into the discussion about that. So I'm going to discuss five main points, then I have some questions, and I just have a few closing remarks, very few. Um, so these were themes I wrote in my notes, themes to take away from the book. So things you should know that should make you read the book. The first one, it's about the economy, stupid. It really is. But it's not economics in the way that we might have been thinking about it. It's not about GDP. It's not about liberalism and privatization. It's about who owns the resources and so I see Eric Gordy here. I have written in caps, informality. <laughs> so we have the expert on informality in the room. It's about the networks that restrict growth, if you will, illiberal networks, hanging on to resources, um, patronage networks, quite well examined in Stark and Bruce in that nice orange book that some of you might be familiar with. That book was about this question of how is it the same powerful actors under communism are still the powerful actors. They ended up with a lot of the economic resources. 
This book is almost the postscript to Stark and Bruce. Guess what? Those same kinds of people are still there, still holding on to the economic resources. But more than that, they buy up the media. And they own those communication resources. That means that they can become almost completely powerful in the state. So in, in effect, they do what we comparatives call capture the state. They just take over all of the institutions using these patronage networks. This has been very under-examined in the transitions literature. The Stark and Bruce book was an exception to what was pretty much a literature written by a lot of economically-minded rational choice types about how if you make good decisions, everything will work out just great. Stark and Bruce, as, as I think um, one of them at least, maybe both were sociologists and said, who owns the resources is going to make a difference, and we see that now. This comes through very strongly in this book, and it's a relief because we don't have enough literature on that. Um, we're going to have to do some stepping back from the transitions literature, and this is going in the right direction. Um, I almost thought of, I wrote a phrase called patronage in action about the book. It really is sort of an examination of how patronage works. Um, now, one of the things I want to flag in this, so in the contribution by Dimitrova, I think every piece touches on this aspect, but she comes up with this phrase called executive aggrandizement, the idea that elites are enriching themselves in the process, although in the Czech case, the elite was already rich, and then sort of used that to shore up political power. What's interesting about that is we see the same processes now in the West. So one of the new books I assigned in my class was called Reckless Opportunists, Elites at the End of the Establishment. It's by Aaron Davies, and it has a picture of Boris Johnson on the cover. <laughs> the fact is that this is not just an East European phenomenon. So something is going on that we need to pay attention to, and you can start in this book, but it certainly has wider implications. So the first one is about economics, informality, and the way in which all the resources are captured, including the media. Second, metrics are not your friends. This is extremely important about the limits of measuring things, which has been a mania in the democracy promotion literature, and it's related to counting things like Supreme Court judges and how they get appointed, etc. A belief that observable things like institutions that we can count up and somehow get a sense of um, their strength, according to Freedom House and other democracy indexes, that those visible things are maybe not the whole story. In fact, looking at those things has been a red herring. That the real story of politics lie in things that are not easily measured things that can't be quantified in Freedom House and other kinds of data. Um, and I think this came through pretty strongly, again, in many of the pieces, um, although James Dawson's piece is really centered on that critique. This is actually quite a serious critique of methodology and about how we conduct the study of politics. It certainly is a critique that, sadly, very few people in the field of political science have paid attention to, but in the post-2016 environment, it's certainly a critique that we need to kind of get with the program and realize that these non-measurable things are actually a big part of the story. Um, so I see Eric on informality nodding. So it's not just institutions. Now, um, it did remind me as well, because I reformed my classes entirely based on recent events. I teach on democracy. If it's not just institutions, then what is democracy? Democracy, Dawson argues, lies in the discourse, and others say it has to do with the way we think about the economy and the way we think about values in politics, really. And I couldn't stop getting this idea in my head. It's like the opposite. Very few people in this room may have read this, but there's an old book by Banfield about the way in which underdeveloped, I'm putting it in scare quotes, but that's, it was written, I think, in the 60s or 70s, about underdeveloped societies and why do they not have democracy. There's a problem of what he calls amoral familialism, in which people only care about having their family survive, and they don't have a collective sense 
of a demos or anything wider than that family unit surviving. And I kept coming back to this because you could sort of map that onto patronage networks. If you don't have a sense of collective value, of being in this together and making decisions together and being invested, you don't really have democracy. And you can count institutions all you want. Now, there are discursive ways to think about that, which James might get into, that have to do with um, communication and how we talk about democracy, that it's kind of in the language we use. But in essence, the substantive content of democracy, not just the procedures, not just the institutions, is very important. This has not been well examined in the field. I assigned a political theory-ish piece by Robert Dahl in my classes that was quite difficult for all of us to read. Um, I, could, I, I don't have the citation here, but if anyone's interested, I could bring it up later. We need to start thinking about the normative content of democracy a bit more and not just in the institutions and things that we can observe and count. Um, now, that feeds into something that comes up in Licia Sinetti's piece on the European Union's conditionality requirements. This idea, it was elite, an elite-driven technocratic democracy project about institution building. Didn't really care whether people were talking about democracy. And so all of that stuff is related to the fact that metrics are not your friends. The field of democracy promotion is very much invested in metrics and it's led us down the wrong path. Okay, a question that comes up especially from Ellie Knott as well as Lisa Sinetti who are looking at the former Soviet Union. Is it backsliding if you were never there? This is the third theme. So the idea of backsliding, which they all aptly note is kind of coming from Hungary and Poland, is that we're this great place, Hungary and Poland, and then what happened over the last decade that they've gone back so quickly? Now, something is strange about this story, even for Hungary and Poland. Maybe there were things that we were not observing because we were counting all the wrong stuff. I can tell you, as someone who's done research on Hungary, and forgive me, those of you who are Hungarian, there's been a long-standing stream of Hungarian nationalism in the domestic narrative and in the narrative of Hungarians abroad. That's unavoidable. So why did people even like me sort of underplay that? That's come through very strongly lately. So maybe even Hungary and Poland were at a place we didn't, that we thought they were when they were not. Um, now, for other countries, there's a pretty strong argument that you've had so not uses this phrase of a dynamic equilibrium. So it looks very much like Tilly's graph. You're not in one place on this. You're just constantly moving around, which depends on the power plays between political actors and how they pan out. I thought that was a very useful way to think about what's going on. These are all hybrids, and they're in different points on that arrow at different times. All right, point four. Um, and... This, again, all these points, this was such a very cohesive book. It's really easy to say that everybody raised these points. They came up in some pieces more than others. But really, everyone is aligned on this idea that stability does not equal democracy. So you can have stable institutions, things the EU like to see for conditionality. Um, Sionetti mentions this in particular. But that's not democratic. There's a hollowing out of the parties. There's been a kind of technocratic move to be able to say that you're doing all the right things for the EU and demobilize publics. So that's not democratic. It's no accident, by the way, this is very much linked to a liberal economic pro project. So don't ask any questions. We are making the economic decisions, taking those dis what now we know are quite political decisions, things like austerity, out of the hands of publics is a political project. Um, there's been a hollowing out of these institutions. People have been told what they need to agree to do, and that has led to a decrease in democracy. Not on a measuring scale, but just a visible lack of ability to pursue a democratic project that we can all share, really. OK, the fifth thing, this is my fifth last theme, what the book really does in a very useful way is give us a pathway to a kind of typology of these hybrids or competitive authoritarian regimes, whatever we want to call them, instead of just talking about 
vague lack of democracy. We actually have substance that we can start to study, ingredients for generalizations. Um, so a typology of hybrids. We have a typology of appeals made to publics to get their support. So I study nationalism. Nationalism used to be a quite common appeal, but there are other ones used as well. So in the piece on the Czech Republic by Vahudova and Hanley, we have, is it Victor Babish? Andre. On, oh, Andre, Andre, Andre Babish. Babish. Makes this technocratic appeal. I'm a business person, and you should just let me solve everything. And that has resonated. So that's a different kind of appeal entirely from nationalism, which they, they point to very well. We need to think about which kind of appeals and strategies are working. Um, in Romania, there has been this kind of just a side note, um, especially from discussions at ASN, there's been an anti-corruption populism. Mm -hmm. That's also an appeal. Uh, Tamás Kish has written pretty well on this. And of course, we have our old friend nationalist populism, which you see being used quite strongly in Hungary and Poland, but coming up elsewhere. Um, so we, this book gives us some really good tools to be able to discuss these. Now, I also found it's used, there are some names given to some of the strategies we see. So appeals, but also strategies. Perhaps they could roll together a little. Um, I think it was not that discuss, I started to, because everyone was on the same line so much. We talked about an authoritarian toolbox. It's this idea that you have a set of tools that you can pick up and use to a certain degree, and we see, unfortunately, the UK government using some of these tools as well, um, certainly Trump in the United States. So rather than thinking of these strict categories for regimes, maybe we need to break it down a bit and think about strategies and techniques. Um, one of these is mentioned in the Bieber piece, the production of crisis as a means to get people to sort of agree with the leader. And in Sianetti, this comes up as the ethnic divide that's used to justify decisions made by the government, demobilize the Russian population, et cetera. Um, I have a side question about that that I'll ask you about later to save on time <laughs> uh, because I want to get to my last points. So I have a few questions about this and then just a couple line, uh, sentences. So um, Ellie Knott mentions these gray cardinals, and I wasn't quite sure. They, they are murky figures in the patronage network, but I wasn't quite sure what, that, what they are. So it would be good to have a kind of clear sense, maybe a generalizable sort of definition of what they are. Um, and for this side of the table, are Estonia and Latvia like Bulgaria in the sense of are they over-reported as being positive stories and what does that tell us? Because this could be happening to other countries as well. Um, this came up in the introduction, so three of you. <laughs> the Galtan Index of Parties, or I hadn't seen that before, I looked it up on the internet. Um, it has to do with the spectrum of ideologies, but it wasn't I could have used more information on that, and so maybe it would be good to just kind of give us a sense of, of that. It has to do with how parties relate to each other. Um, let's see. Ah, which terms should we use? Some, in some places, these were hybrid regimes. In other places, they were competitive authoritarianism. Is that just sort of accidental, or is there a, a substantive difference between those terms? Is party volatility an opportunity? So if you look at the Czech Republic, party volatility has been shocking there. It just means that you keep changing the parties available. Um, Romania has had something like this too. Does that mean that if we can change things, if there's a lot of agency, does that give us hope? Or is that a bit scary that things can go so, change so quickly? Um, the public are mentioned. I'm curious a bit more about publics. Are they cynical only? Are they apathetic? Are they sad? Are they angry? Are they okay with all of this? It would be good to know sort of a little bit more about publics and how could we study that? Publics are hard to study. Is there a way? We, it's, it's a good start to work on the elites and the parties, but then could we dig a bit deeper into the publics? Um, what can we learn about populism? Because that's a topic a lot of people want to understand right now. 
from this kind of, I don't want to call it a depressing story, but realistic story about Central Europe. Um, how could you explain to the West what's happening to the West, which seems very similar in some ways to this? Now, the role of the EU, um, I was very fascinated by in CNN. So in, in, I wrote a book that came out in 2012 about how the EU didn't really matter for ethnic relations, long story short. That wasn't the only argument, but that was one of the arguments. And in Cianetti's piece, I was fascinated by the idea that it's not just that. The EU made things worse by <laughs> telling people they had to um, tick these technocratic boxes and it thus demobilized the ethnic population of the ethnic minority. Well, Russians whether they're always a minority is a question. But th I found that really interesting because that would certainly upset the same people I upset, but even more. <laughs> and so it'd be good to know a bit more about that. Is that, is that a, a, too, an, a too extreme a sort of representation or is that about what you're thinking? Um, it, would have been, it would be interesting to know a bit more on neoliberalism, things like the Washington Consensus and the idea of privatization behind a lot of these projects. Um, that external actors were pushing in the region and how that might have translated into patronage networks. And then I have a question about structure and agency, but I'll leave that for later. You don't have to. So in general, this is just a very strong book. And, you know, I'll be honest. When someone says, oh, can you do a book panel or edited book? You think, oh, boy, you know, what if the pieces don't fit together? What if you know, I don't know what to say? This is probably the strongest edited book I've seen in a very long time. So it's really, I'd really recommend it to you. Um, it reads almost like a book by a single author because there are so many ideas that they share. That's very unusual. Um, it has a lot of implications for how we think about democracy, how we think about what's going on in the West, how we understand populism. So in general, it's not just about Central Europe and its surrounding area, it's about the world, really, um, both democracies and non-democracies. So with that, I'm finished, and you all have five minutes each. Okay, so uh, I think we're being recorded. So I'm um, James Dawson. I lecture in politics at Coventry University. Um, um, so y you asked, Cheryl, uh, are Estonia and Latvia like Bulgaria in the sense that they are uh, overreported as positive stories? Um, could I ask a follow-up question about the question? So, uh, over-reported by, by whom and in, in particular in what respects? I'm thinking about Bulgaria. Um, a lot of the international press seems to be, to be negative, at least at this point in time. So, so do, do you mean by scholars? By, yes, databases. Oh, okay. Quantitative measures. Okay, limited experience about the, the Baltic region. Um, why would a country uh, like Bulgaria uh, be tended to be um, over overestimated the extent to which they achieved in democratization, especially at the time of recession? Um, and I would argue that the that what happened there was that the um, the EU uh, was able to work together with these. Um, uh, quite technocratic neoliberal parties that squeaked into office um, and these parties were interested to um, tick the boxes that the EU wanted them to tick, institutions uh, signing up to conventions on minority rights, these kinds of things um, often uh, in the absence of uh, public debate they wanted to do this with as little uh, public contention as they, as they possibly could um, and actually, that, that was easier to do, in my view, in countries where there was uh, a less vibrant public sphere, uh, like Bulgaria, than it was to do in countries where the public sphere was more, more polarised and active, like uh, Serbia, Croatia, and, and so on, uh, at, at that time. So um, I think that's one reason why they um, tended to be overestimated at that time. Um, are they still overranked as democracies? Um, probably, I, I, I think. Um, different metrics are going in different directions, right? I mean, uh, but Bulgaria has benefited from being in the EU. I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that the EU has made things worse. Um, the EU uh, employed the strategy from the Copenhagen um, 
with criteria onwards of, of, of 1993 of um, building institutions at all costs, um, focusing on elections, minority rights, human rights, and so on. I would argue that that was quite a good idea. You know, it, it was quite a... Um, they hadn't done this when they allowed Sweden and Austria in. It was a new thing to say that to get into the EU... Um, you need to be a, a functioning liberal democracy and to have ticked these legal institutional boxes. Um, I would argue that it was kind of a good botch job, uh, a starting point from which the EU should then have uh, pressed for kind of on-the-ground outcomes. Uh, things like, OK, well, you've signed the Convention on National Minorities, uh, now, now let the, the public conversation begin. And, and this kind of cultural educational project uh, not only didn't happen, uh, and, and not only Bulgaria, but much of the region, but, but, but the opposite happened. The same uh, politicians, often pro-European politicians, that were <coughs> signing these conventions were at the same time signalling to national publics that they didn't really take this stuff seriously. Right? They were ratcheting up their rhetoric to show that they wouldn't uh, go into coalition with an ethnic minority party. They were um, uh, giving uh, civic awards to the wrong kinds of authors. Um, I'll make one last point, that when we, we look at a lot of the, um, the kind of rationalist, institutionalist, uh, political science literature that celebrated the success of the EU in, in building these institutions, and for sure the EU and its leverage was important in getting these institutions built, and it's better to have you know, functioning elections and judicial systems than, than not having them. Um, a lot of this literature... Um, it's interesting because the main headline findings of all of the, the kind of mainstream pulse literature 15 years ago is, wow, isn't the EU fantastic? You know, the most successful democratisation exercise in the history of the world. You know, that's the kind of headline. But if you read the caveats, there's often a kind of double speak, right? There's democracy is at the same time mission accomplished. All of these countries have achieved institutions, often from, like Bulgaria, very low starting points that are almost uh, equal in quality to those in the West. Um, and um, at the same time, there's a sense of unease that there's a kind of cultural uh, educational project that has yet to really begin. Yeah, so there's a kind of double speak. There's a uh, you know, there's often caveats in this literature. If you look on page 175, of course, you know, this isn't a prediction that, um, that, that these institutions will continue to function well in the future, um, which, which often contradicts the title of the articles or the books. Um, and if I, if I can raise one last point here, often people saw this at the time. Right? If, you, if, you, if you read scholarship in the top Pulsi journals about these countries, uh, we see um, generally they're celebrating the success of the whole project. If you read the uh, lower-ranking uh, journals, like Nationalities, Papers... Um, lower ranking. <laughs> l lower ranking than, you know, APSR and JCMS and, and, and these ones that we try so hard to get into... Um, we find, of course, single country studies that we can infer from them, huh, actually the EU's minority rights regime didn't work so well in Bulgaria. Um, and this was not like now, this is stuff that's published in 2001, 2007. So I want to say that this uh, language-based area studies kind of approach, it actually worked very well in producing scholarship that stands up very well 15 years later in the light of what has happened since. Um, the only thing that they didn't do was that they didn't infer from their findings about economic inequality or um, minority rights that this says something about democracy as a regime. And if they were bolder in doing so, I think we, we wouldn't have had such a you know, celebratory mainstream at that time. Thank you. Okay. So I link up to the last point that James was making about um, democracy and a general forgetfulness in the measuring and the defining of democracy about minorities. Um, and that comes up in the kind of big measurements of democracy and the kind of number-based measurements where minorities kind of end up uh, somewhere either lost or operationalized in very banal ways um, and sort of lost that way. 
And that, in a way, kind of comes to um, uh, Cheryl's question about Estonia and Latvia and whether they were overreported as positive um, cases of democratization. Um, and in a sense, yes, but it does depend on what kind of measure you're interested in. They were very successful, also compared to the rest of the region, in establishing institutions that so far seem quite solid institution, working institutions, um, rule of law seem to work better than other countries. So on those measurements, they seem to have done well. At the same time, that um, the narrative of all oh, this, you know, two plus one kind of um, post-Soviet, only post-Soviet countries who democratize so well, um, narrative forgets what was not done, um, the ways in which that the, those democracies were emptied out of popular content. Because these projects of building those institutions were top-down projects and were top-down projects in two ways. Um, in the technocratic way that you mentioned, and it's often mentioned for the region, but also in the sense that the um, democratizing, Europe Europeanizing elites uh, that built the institutions were also ethnic majority elites. So they also had uh, a nationalizing agenda. And that agenda went hand to hand with an economic agenda. Um, so, yeah, were, were they over reported as positive states, uh, separate cases? Yes. I would say, which doesn't mean that they're not democracies. I think the point um, that you know, my uh, piece makes there, but all our pieces make, is that we should rethink about how we look at democracy in general, not only in the region. Um, so when I say that measuring democracy forgets minorities, for example, I think of you know, one egregious case is um, a policy four that gives top scores to the United States, and then in the description of the country, so the kind of uh, narrative section, just mentions that there were some problems, you know, Jim Crow and kind of some exclusions, mm -hmm. but still we give them top marks, as if that were not part of um, any mainstream measurement of democracy, but a second thought. Mm. That the exclusion of, of minorities can be something is this, that the inclusion of minorities in something is desirable but not part of being a fully functioning democracy. Um, so that's, I think, something that comes out um, of looking at minorities in the region that we could expand to them studying democracy in the West. Um, often, literature in the region talks about the double standard the way we look at minorities in the region and we inquire about how those governments treat minorities, that, and then we don't put those same lenses on Western European democracies. That, that came from the European Union, but also comes from us as scholars, often enough. We don't ask the same questions of the countries we live in sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that connects to another point that you made about um, stability and democracy and potential trade-offs. Um, so one of the points that um, I think, in a way, all of us make in different ways is that um, the focus of the backsliding literature on Hungary and Poland um, not only um, is reductive geographically, but also um, drove a certain focus on institutional resilience. Because things have gone so bad in these two countries and there are worries for the... Uh, survival of democratic institutions, then we'll all be looking at those ins at, at institutions um, and whether they're stable or not, forgetting the fact that a less than democratic institution can be stable. Uh, and then, in fact, uh, minority exclusion, for example, can be an element of stability. You don't have, you exclude a minority from being able to um, contest and go against established institutions or certain policies, that reduces the amount of friction in the system. Once you exclude uh, voices, you have less debate, less polarization. Um, and that, again, uh, that's one of the reasons, at least I would argue, why Estonia comes um, above Latvia in um, all measurements of democracy. There is now, we'll see what happens with Estonian politics now. It's kind of getting messy. But up until now, uh, <laughs> um, there, was there was definitely less contentious politics. Um, there is a more um, kind of excluded um, minority that do does not participate in the democratic debate much. And therefore, you have a less polarized debate, which has been seen as a good for democracy. 
And I think that you'll be happy to hear this because you said something like that in your book, contentious politics is part of democracy and must be part of democracy. So the fact that in Latvia there's been more contention mm. has also been an effect of the fact that the minority is not completely disempowered. So an empowered minority, uh, by definition, the process of empowerment is uh, a process of changing the balance of power. Somebody loses out of that. That's not going to happen without frictions. Um, so frictions uh, are also part of um, a democratic story there. Uh, and just very quick, connected to that with your question about the EU, whether you know, it made things worse. Uh, it did to the extent that it forgot about contention. So if you want policies to be passed and you have the, your blueprint of the policies that are good policies, and we could agree, I think all of us, that there were good minority policies that were also um, passed. So in terms of um, the policy outcome, if we can say, yes, there was a, a win in both countries, Estonia and Latvia, but across the region in, in general. But then the result that, that came through what we could see as a worse process if you're interested in democracy as a process that includes contention. Um, worse process because the negotiations between um, EU advisors and um, majority elites substituted the um, dialogue and debate, democratic debate between majority and minority, for example, on minority issues. So the minority became an object of politics, and that helped establishing the dominance of the majority over the policymaking process. Um, so it's not like the EU is the bad guy, but the strategy used disregarded that democracy is a process, and in doing that, empowered majorities uh, over minorities. Okay, great. I should mention as well. Lysia Sinetti is at Royal Holloway, University uh, yes, of London. Sorry. And what I, sh so I'm, I keep forgetting his chair to <laughs> introduce him. And James Dawson is at Co Coventry University. Um, Sean Hanley is at CCCL. And Ellie Knott is at London School of Economics and Political Science. So now we're on to Sean yeah, Hanley. I'll leave the question about great cardinals to Ellie, but I, I, I will just mention that this type of informal behind the scenes actor does occur in other contexts. So the, the, in the Czech context, uh, a lot of Czech politics uh, until about 10 years ago was focused on the so-called regional godfathers who were informal power brokers who had captured parties at, at regional level and were kind of brokers in, in, in political um, power. Okay. Um, the, the point about economics and, and informality, this kind of emerged, I think, Kind of organically through the through the book, and I think it's definitely something to pursue. Um, and I think it leads us in a particular direction, and it leads us to think about concepts of power. So not not just about institutional stability, institutional performance, but about concepts of power, and a sort of realist view of democracy, not just in a, as, as a euphemism for pessimism, but in, in seeing democracy as a as as a way of of managing conflict and managing different centres of power. So to come back to the idea of polyarchy, of multiple centres of, 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 um, of power. Um, the point about Galtan. So Galtan is green alternative left, traditional authoritarian nationalist. And it's the idea which is quite common in um, studying patterns of party competition, that there's a cross-cutting cultural division um, which cross-cuts the more the, the distributional conflict between left and right, so not just um, who gets what, when, where and how, but how we sort of live our lives. Um, and I guess in, in the context of the backsliding debate, certainly taking Hungary and Poland as the exemplars, the idea is that it's not just populism, it's nativism or it's social conservatism which is somehow the, somehow the threat. Um, paradoxically, in Hungary and Poland, it's, it's, it, it wasn't the kind of post-communist. Everyone was in 1990s, which you mentioned. Everyone's afraid of the, the former communists, and oh, thank God, they're all reforming and becoming social democrats, and so that's okay. Um, it's, it's parties of the right uh, in Hungary and Poland with often very good 
backgrounds in the opposition which have turned out apparently to be the, uh, be the problem. So Kaczynski or Orban, these are people with, with excellent kind of pedigrees going back into the uh, opposition movement and yet somehow it's this post-opposition conservatism which, which seems to have been the, uh, the problem. Looking beyond these two cases in, in someone like Czechia, the question is really is someone like Andrei Babiš a kind of Viktor Orban light? Uh, is he a sort of Trumpian figure, but just uh, in a slightly watered-down way? Or does this technocratic anti-corruption populism pose a, pose a problem? And I think just reflecting back, one thing I've noticed reading about Poland and Hungary is that the governing parties are not just about social conservatism and nationalism, they're also about empowering the state and having a kind of capable uh, state. The point about kind of ambiguities, I think Cheryl has this really great phrase about not backsliding but sliding around, and I think this is this is one kind of tilly, really. It's tilly, okay. (laughs) Um, It's one kind of conceptual move. I I think we need to make Mm. because I think I I think the idea that we're either optimistic or pessimistic. It, it's something we need to move beyond. So democratization literatures tend to slide between optimism and pessimism, and we have to be quite careful and look for this much more nuanced kind of patterns. And, and I think the, the Czech case is particularly... It's a good way of exercising this, because on the one hand we have Babish, and he's an anti-corruption campaigner, and, they, and he's drawing on a genuine impetus for for change, and there has been reform, and the Czech Republic functions quite well um, and at the same time he is this oligarch sitting atop a uh, with other oligarchs an economy which is in some ways quite uh, equal so we've got this nuance and this kind of complexity in which the backsliding narrative doesn't really capture so just to talk about for example my kind of trajectory with, with, the, with, the, with the Czech Republic. Paradoxically, as I've gone through my career, in some ways I've, I've sensed the less I understand about Czech politics. The more people invite me to talk about it, the less I <laughs> realise I genuine, genuinely understand about it. <laughs> Still because invite him. We have these paradoxes. And I think just finally to, to, to pick up on the concept of, um, of, of trade-offs, I think this is linked to sliding around, not backsliding, I think this is also quite, um, quite important. I think Babish may be the Czech Trump, but in a positive sense. It's, it's unlikely that Donald Trump, despite his authoritarian inclinations, will be able to do major serious damage to US institutions in the way that, say, Viktor Orban has managed to do with, with, with Hungary. I think this, that might be true of the Czech Republic, whose institutions have so far proved, for various reasons, quite robust. But the question would be, at what price does that happen? In the sense, is it going to be survival, but at the cost of degrading the country's democratic um, politics? Okay, great. Okay, I'll start with the issue of grey cardinals. So who are they? Um, So in the paper, I talk uh, very much about Vladimir Plahotnyuk, who is um, kind of the biggest oligarch in Moldova, and... um, for a long time, no one knew what he looked like. Um, no one then knew his name. He also has a double identity. He has a Romanian passport in another identity. So he has this kind of murky business, political... So it's kind of basically a transition from business to politics. And as a businessman, it was really kind of unclear who he was. And then suddenly kind of transitioned um, to politics in the kind of late 2000s. Um, and is now the president of the Democrat Party, and I think an MP, although they're still to form a government, so let's see. And I think, I can't remember what I quote in the paper, but owns something like two-thirds of Moldovan media. And again, that was murky, that was unknown. Until civil society really investigated it, it was really unclear what he owned in terms of like media assets. So I guess one of the questions is, why pursue state capture after resource capture or do those sequences necessarily happen together or where does media capture happen in that sequencing and I think like different I think the Czech case talks about a different sequencing but it's but it's like these things kind of happen in tandem or there are similar traits that we see across it and so when Cheryl said is this idea of a great cardinal generalizable I didn't invent this term in any way obviously as we think of like Vladislav Surkov in Russia as the almost like ideal type great cardinal Thinking in the West, I mean, is Steve Bannon a grey cardinal? Is Aaron Banks a grey cardinal? I mean, it's kind of these murky figures with business media interests 
and they at some point become on the political scene. And I think the problem with me for saying what well, Aaron Banks is a great cardinal is it makes it seem like it's necessarily nefarious in a way that we might also want to critique. But I think the point is we don't necessarily have these concepts um, ready to work with. That being, so, so what do we learn from great cardinals? And I think it's that we need to look beyond kind of executive aggrandizement. We need to look beyond incumbents, not just because informality is kind of the way that politics is done, but that there are many people who hold power in the system that don't necessarily hold political office or don't necessarily at that particular point hold formal political office as president, um, but can certainly be manipulating the rules, manipulating the system. And it leads to this really big puzzle uh, at least in kind of former Soviet space. And for example, with Ukraine, which is the other case that I look at, we'll see kind of what happens now Zelensky is president. But the big puzzle is why when elites change, does the system not change? So we have this turnover elites and Cheryl was talking about kind of party volatility. And Moldova has gone through a, like a massive transition in the last, massive stages of transition in the last 10 years. And the elites repeat on themselves, the parties kind of reformulate, but the system doesn't really change, and corruption and nepotism still are the kind of the game in town. And at some point, uh, you either become a part of the system or you get thrown in prison because you probably have done stuff, but you're not the only person that's like stolen the billion. And you either become corrupted yourself or you kind of lose power. So, like, what are the incentives to reform? Are there any incentives for reform? And if we think of hybrid regimes as kind of encapsulating this around sliding dynamic, elites can change, but the system stays very much in place. And I think we need to, again, go back to this idea of informality and not focus on what politicians necessarily want us to see. And so it's not just about what's measurable, it's what's visible and the kind of taken for grantedness of politics. And look at power, because again, when we think of Moldova, I think of how many studies that are talking about identity politics as the kind of key cleaver in society, and no one is talking about friend family networks, which is kind of the fabric, right? So, Kumaturism is like the center of what's going on. And until we, I'm not, I mean, maybe it's intractable, maybe it cannot be changed, but until we kind of actually know who are, how are parties kind of situating themselves on these friend family networks, who is Pahutnyuk uh, godfather to? who is the godfather of but like, literally those networks until we start to kind of understand that and understand how that is kind of playing into everything. I think we really understand how power is dissipating and what politics is really They're lit- doing. literally godfathers. Literally, physically. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, for example, I mean, again, if we think of this in the UK context, it's like Tony Blair and Rupert Murdoch. So it's those kinds of like very intricate ways in which society is bound up. And again, maybe Eton is the patronage network of the UK. I mean, I'm being a little bit facetious, but like it's that kind of level of the structure of society and how politics is kind of playing into that. I had one point, which is both uh, saying that uh, something that Lucia was talking about. Um, I don't think it's just that we tolerate exclusion of minorities when we think about uh, concepts of democracy. I think it's that we exclude, uh, we're, we're tolerating exclusion of majorities because why is it that we consider countries to be democratic before mass enfranchisement? So, uh, like, 50% of the population can't vote because they're women, but we consider them democracies anyway historically over time, and why do we tolerate that kind of definition of democracy? And I think, sorry, going back to informality, I actually don't necessarily think that we can't measure informality. I just don't think we have the imagination to measure it at the moment. I don't think it's impossible for it to measure it, but I don't think we have the way that like, the, the ability to conceptualize it at this point which is why we don't have the names for the the gray cardinals and various, yeah, yeah i mean all of this stuff could be made visible it could be made observable but until we start to really question what we're taking for granted in the system and how we're pursuing the study of politics i don't think we really can go beyond it okay there we go <laughs> this is so you can see how substantive this book is um and now it would be good to hear from you some questions about the book. Okay, yes. Um, Adam Clay from uh, King's College London. Uh, I also um, share all of your um, enthusiasm for the book, Cheryl, um, and I've read it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I think it's fine. My question is um, well, it's sort of two part really. One is to kind of ask everybody, all of the panel really, I mean, 
the, there's an embedded kind of critique here of the um, of the EU and the organisation process, both overt and, and covert. But in a sense, is it not the fact that, that, that these countries are members of the EU, and because, uh, is it not a, a contribute to the EU organisation process that we actually can have some sort of basis for judging backsliding? In other words, you know, it's given us, and I take your point entirely about metrics, um, but, but it does give us, if nothing else, a, a, a basis for saying actually these countries are, are, are moving around. Um, and I think related to that, you know, is the risk perhaps that um, we end up, I mean I don't, is it that actually it's metrics that measuring this the problem? Or is it that we, it's the dipstick measure, you know, in other words, that we want to, we want to measure in order to, to quantify and to stop? Because I don't think it's necessarily measuring in, in itself that the, the, the difficulty. My, my, my problem with this is that, you know, it's, the EU locks something in, and that becomes the moment at which these countries are a democracy. And, and, and in fact, that's really what's under, under contention here. And so, so we run the risk of, of saying, well, okay, we shouldn't be measuring. Yeah, I think we should be measuring, but I think we should resist this idea of saying, okay, they've reached a point, and therefore they are now democracy. And that's really a, a very dangerous trap, which I think all of the contributions do speak to. So I'm sorry if it's not actually a question. Okay, other ones. Yes. Very quickly. Uh, oh, wait. Who? Yes. Who are well, my name is Celeste. I manifest for the book and for the debate today. My question would be more, shall we talk about rethinking democratic sliding, or shall we rethink in to the European Union democratic conditionality, also looking at experience not just in the region, but looking at how conditionality has worked uh, across the Western Balkans? Thanks. We've got one more space for a question going once. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Pete Duncan. Um, I teach at the UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies. Um, could I, uh, first of all, bring Russia back in? Russia has been backsliding, or not really even sliding around, since Ireland, at least 1990, possibly 1993, you could argue, certainly since 1999. Uh, does your book make comparisons with Russia? Um, and now responding to uh, your point, Cheryl, about um, the, you say to, how to explain to the West what's happening. Um, is in the um, we're just uh, producing now the book Socialism, Capitalism, Alternatives from the, to the conference that Nietzsche was kind enough to participate in, um, where we brought it out from the region to the world. And um, is there not a case to say that whereas in the 1980s, 90s the West was showing the East the supposed advantage of neoliberalism, marketization, privatization, and so on. Um, but now the East, as we only show the West, uh, where this goes, the West might have rather stronger institutions in one way or another, um, and was able to delay the process after the financial crisis. But seeing the uh, right-wing populism from um, in, in uh, Orban or Kuczynski and so on, uh, first in the East, and now, um, seeing it in the West for similar reasons. Austria, Brexit, Trump, people already mentioned them. People, my daughter also mentioned closer to the regions we're looking at, Austria and uh, Salvini. Um, and does your book begin to address these issues about how your, the region of the book is relevant to the West? Thank you. Okay, great. That's a good set of questions. So anyone who feels moved... I've got a response for, 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 for you, Pete, which I think is that a, a great deal of how you think about Central Eastern Europe depends really how you frame it. So do we, do we frame sort of democracy and its backsliding, whatever we call it, in the context of, say, the post-communist world? So we include Russia and we say, well, you know, Russia's an early extreme case. Or... Do we do what we tended to do, which is we frame it as part of, uh, as the sort of periphery of Western democracies? And we get somewhat different answers depending on how we do this. And there are different views we can take of how Central and Eastern Europe lines up with the West. So James and I were having this quite interesting conversation about work on cultural liberalism and uh, people like Norris and Inglehart who've linked. Uh, 
democratic backsliding and populism to this kind of conservative shift. And then one view is that in the West, there's a lot of cultural liberalism and that populism is driven by a, a backlash from a minority of declining uh, so, social, uh, social groups. Whereas, say, in Central and Eastern Europe, there isn't actually that much cultural liberalism, which suggests that the regions are really not comparable. And I don't agree, Peter. I think that the, well, the story of white right-wing populism in Western Europe goes back right into the 1970s, 1980s, and the degree of influence from the East is, is, is probably, uh, probably limited. Um, I guess I can uh, take up the first question, Adam. Um, you're asking whether, if I understood the question, whether the problem is measuring or the once and for all nature of the threshold. Um, I think both. Um, so it's not measuring per se, um, although measuring can be a blunt tool, um, but measuring what and how. Right? So what I think all of us are saying there is that measuring just at the level of the institutions and of uh, policies or so policy outcomes misses out a lot in terms of the process of democracy. And then and that's that process is biting back in a way. Um, and then, yeah, definitely the, the uh, once and for all threshold, that's also a problem. Uh, and I, I would say uh, it's a problem for any democracy. So the democracy is never an accomplished project. Um, and we can find that in all democracies, if we look at them deeply enough, uh, we can find worrying signs, but also uh, heartening signs. I think um, I was thinking while we were talking that maybe now we're looking at uh, Hungary and Poland through the prism of backsliding and we forget, we risk forgetting some of the positives that might then justify when and if they, their democracies kind of go around uh, mm. to becoming better. Right now we're all yeah, focusing on seeing the, the, the bad... Long-term sort of Tillian yes. perspective that um, Antoinette Dimitrova's chapter has... has Arrow can exactly. go around. Exactly. Mm. Um, yeah. So kind of a, a deeper way of measuring or putting together measuring a more deep qualitative understanding of power um, in democracies might help us see this longer term perspective and see factors that counteract each other. I think Ellie's um, article kind of does that also looking at factors that go in counter directions. So there are factors that yeah. promote democratizations and factors that go against democratization. And she uses it to uh, look at hybrid regimes and how they stay in this equilibrium where they don't democratize and they don't become authoritarian. But I think a similar approach could be useful to look at all democracies and how they kind of stay within this. Of equity, we stay in democracies, maybe, but worse and then better and then worse and so on. Um, if I could also pick up Adam's question, um, I think that you know, if, if a measurement and eva a normative evaluation are essentially the same thing, and I, I think that they are, I think that one just tends to be enumerated and the other isn't necessarily so. Um, I'm a big fan of measurement, actually. I think that. Um, you know, if you look at the public sphere literature, people like Habermas or, or Chantal Mouth and, and their many followers, uh, they're, they're often, uh, let's say, taking aim at a Western society with pristine institutions and saying, aha, not so democratic. And um, I think that this is uh, very helpful. And I, I think that actually the problem, the key problem here is that we're, we're often measuring part of the story and then inferring that it's the whole of the story. You know, so we, we see institutions, we see the legal institutional framework, and we forget that a legal institutional framework will only work if people actually believe in it, both citizens and office holders. Um, so, you know, I'm quite excited by very mainstream work, like um, Christian Beltzel is working on emancipated values, and he says that this is a um, predictor for where we're going to see democracy in the future if it's not there already or where democracy is going to hold up over time. Um, and, you know, I tend to think in terms of uh, the spread of ideas. Cultural liberalism, I think, is very important. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how far this travels outside of parts of the world where, where, where liberalism is not part of the conversation. Um, I, 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 I don't know uh, how strong the rationale is for um, 
you, you, you know, this third wave idea that demo liberal democracy has to be the default form of in, uh, um, regime for every country in the world. I don't know if I would back that. But definitely, so far as we're talking about Central and Eastern Europe, um, I'm not shy about the fact that I am part of this, you know, movement that involves people like the EU um, that is trying to, to put this thing in place. I, I, I think that it, it's uh, a positive thing. Um, yeah, also in the metric thing, I mean, I, I use VDEM metrics in the paper and they show you the story right they show you the ebb and flow i mean the electoral uh bar is kind of way higher than like the deliberative participation etc but they still at least tell you the story over time but i think the point is the story shouldn't end there right like our interrogation of what's going on shouldn't be the dependent variable is this variation and we're just going to look at the kind of observable independent variables to explain that it's like let's go deeper and see what we can't see in order to explain this relationship um, that's kind of my first point. And then the second point is, if we're going to critique the EU, I want to expand it way broader than that. I mean, um, I think first we need to like not just see Europeanisation as a kind of institutional process, but also as a discursive process. And the problem with Moldova is that there has been a, a kind of discursive Europeanisation. Like there's a, I mean, it doesn't really exist anymore, but like a, a European coalition, tripartite coalition, and they've really <coughs> for a long time owned what Europeanisation meant and degraded it discursively and absolutely no substantive Europeanisation in any sense, if we consider that to be democratisation. Um, and no one has held them accountable because of this idea that Moldova is in an east-west struggle and discursive Europeanisation is better than nothing. And if we don't critique them, then maybe they'll hold power and like Russia or socialists won't kind of get into that space. And so I also think this like idea of discursive Europeanization and substantive Europeanization needs to like actually be understood. That, that I mean, the EU needs to be broader, and also like the IMF, the World Bank, and Western media, right? So I just found this. I remembered it because it's a bugbear of mine. But Plahotniuk wrote this op-ed in Politico, and if you try to write an op-ed about Plahotniuk that's critical, it's very hard to get it published. But, but there are like lobby firms and organisations that are also part of this as well that are getting these op-eds into Western media and are portraying this idea again. That, like, it's kind of what we want to hear, right? Uh, we need you and you need us because otherwise these really bad people are going are gonna to win power. And it's like, yeah, but you have degraded what Europeanisation means in that context so much that like, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> kind of, like really like the degradation of what Europeanisation is as a concept in a local way. Can I just throw one comment in about just the metrics? I don't think it's just about measuring or not measuring or how to measure. I just want to pick up on what James says. It, 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 it potentially involves a shift in how we think about institutions, mm -hmm. what they are and how they work in this more... Um, I think, just, I, I, Cheryl, you said something about this in your introduction, in a more sort of sociological mm. kind of um, direction. I also, as well, I, I, don't, I don't, it's, I don't think, I mean, you could read a lot of the contributions as a sort of embedded critique of the EU, but I don't think you necessarily need to do it. The EU is just part of the institutional architecture in Central Eastern Europe, but then so are national and domestic institutions. So I would, I would say, I don't know, is, is, did the Beatles say it? Well, it's the institution um, and how we think about institutions and the fact that maybe they're not as sticky as we, uh, as we, um, as, as we tended to assume or as the conventional literature with its focus on, on incentives and conditionalities has tended to uh, assume. So I, I think we need to have the idea of institutions sort of at the back of our minds um, can I also, I, this thing about Russia, like why do we not talk about Russia? And I think one of the things about the special issue and the book is that we don't actually focus on like the big cases, right? We focus on the more liminal and peripheral cases or not, I mean, Moldova is like that kind of idol type, but like the things that you might often overlook. And I think this book is also about that, right? Like the cases that have been overlooked in backsliding literature or the cases that have been overlooked in the region because of the focus on Russia potentially is kind of what we're trying to... But the, the literature on the post-Soviet space, possibly also on, on, on southeastern Europe, 
I found is potentially incredibly useful for Central and Eastern yeah. Europe because we're saying there's all this sure. informality. Well, who's been writing about informality? Well, it's people who've looked at the post-Soviet space where everybody knows that it's informality, which is the way, the way things work. So, so this tripartite division that we've had between <laughs> Central and Eastern Europe, South Eastern Europe and post-Soviet space, which is even, I think, embedded in CIS's uh, policy documents somewhere, I, I couldn't quote your chapter from first, maybe we should start to break down that, that, that mental division. I, I found work on, um, you know, your work on Moldova, but, and also other stuff I've read, very thought-provoking even for the Czech Republic, which is not to say the Czech Republic is like Moldova, but we need these new ideas and these to, in order to make sense of, of, what's, mm-hmm. of what's happening. <laughs> I think that's exactly right. Let me just check. Are you satisfied that your question was answered? Okay, bits around. All right. Feel free to have a follow-up later on. If, all right, taking more questions. Was that... Okay, yeah. What's your name? I'm from UCL. What's your last name? Gordy. Cheryl, will you have two questions? Yeah. Okay. So here are my two questions. Uh, what do you mean by back and what do you mean by democracy? Um, should I explain them? Okay, so for back, I mean, um, here's what, uh, um, in, in our research on informality, one of the big assumptions behind most existing informality studies is that, um, is that informality in the present is a legacy of, uh, of socialism. Right, that in socialist states you have these institutions that didn't work and people found ways of getting around, around the, the fact that they didn't work so they could get the things that they need um, and they continue doing it under new post-socialist institutions that don't work. And it turns out that's not really the case, um, at least according to, uh, um, to our research. Attitudes are different and practices are different. Um, I mean, what, uh, what you had in socialism were substitutive institutions um, that uh, that were coping with the inadequacies of uh, um, of official formal institutions, and uh, and what you have in the present are competitive institutions that occupy the space where um, you would think that the state would uh, um, would function. Um, so even if you want to talk about party states, you know, political parties in their informal control of employment and education in every aspect of social life, um, have control that extends much farther than the control of the Communist Party ever um, extended. Um, the Communist Party was only interested in politically sensitive positions. So, uh, so we reached the conclusion there really are no legacies of socialism, um, that, uh, um, that the corruptive character of informality is a product of transition. It's not something old or a tradition. It's, it's something new. So you can't blame it on the communists. You can't blame it on the Ottoman Empire. It's a product <laughs> of, uh, of transition. Um, so, uh, um, so in that sense, are we going back? Are we backsliding? Or are we actually entering something that's being created by the contradictions of, uh, of the emerging system? Um, and then uh, when I ask what you mean by democracy, uh, um, I mean, and this is something I, I haven't had the pleasure of reading the book yet, and I'm sure this is something that you answer in great detail in the book. Um, and that is, a lot of the examples that all of the authors gave in their presentations had to do with the use of political institutions to further the centralization of control of economic power. Um, and uh, um, and this is uh, this is maybe uh, you know one of the big contradictions here that. Uh, um, the European Union comes in and they say we're going to promote democracy in two ways. One, by telling you you need to have competitive electoral systems and independent judiciary and all that, right? And the other by saying um, everything has to be privatized and marketized. You know, so the, uh, the effect of one may be democratic and the effect of the other may be terribly anti-democratic. And if that's the case, may I notice that um, all of the authors, again, when you were explaining your examples, you were doing it by making analogies to things that are familiar to people in this country, saying, you know, this phenomenon is like Trump, this phenomenon is like, uh, is like Rupert Murdoch or Eaton or, um, or, or something like that. Um, so is this, uh, is this contradiction between um, 
the democratizing of structures and the de-democratizing of, uh, of the economy um, something that's unique to Central and Eastern Europe, or is it a, a fundamental problem with democracy that we need to uh, Okay. So no, it was good. I just want to summarize in case those at the back couldn't hear it very well. So we have, the first question is on what is back because they have found in the INFORM project that Eric's been doing, um, legacies of socialism are not the issue because quite different corrupt networks in socialism versus now. Instead, they're a product of transition. And second, on democracy, um, the contradiction of the EU democratizing the sense of elections, but then centralizing economic control by privatizing it and thus putting it in the hands of few. You said that so much better than I did. Well, no, it was, it's just to summarize, because I saw a few people in the back I think couldn't quite hear very well. So, because they're really good questions. It was perfectly clear, Rick. It's a very good question. It's just that people behind you probably, because it's kind of a, it's this, the wood sucks things up. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> All right, another question. Yes. Um, as a sociologist, I would like to design so probably ask the obvious question for a sociologist. Um, whether class um, figures somewhere in your analysis and whether, whether and to what extent, in what way, um, to what extent you think it's a, it's a useful um, analysis to be had um, when you consider power distribution and uh, those networks that you think. Okay, the role of class, and we have room for one more question this round. I'm stunned into silence. I suppose Eric had two. Yes, we've got three. Eric did have two. <laughs> All right, so we'll go with those. All right. I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you, Eric, and the first one. Um, uh, that I think that makes perfect sense. So if we take a figure like Andrei Babish, one thing that people invariably point out, both his, his critics politically and academics who've written about him, is that he's somebody who has this background in the communist nomenclature uh, and he was a member of the Communist Party and, and so on and so forth. Um, but actually this is a complete misreading. He's led most of his life, made most of his career in the 30-odd years of post-1989 um, capitalism. So he's at least as much a product of post-communist democracy as the communist nomenclature that he, that he made his early career in. Um, the democracy issue, I think, yeah, I, th I agree. I think this point is really well made, that we know that social institutions are not, uh, within liberal democracies, are not democratic, and, and I occasionally ask if this university was a political regime, what kind of political regime would it be? Um, and I think even Giovanni Sartori has this, has this quote somewhere, I can't quite remember from where, that in a democracy we wouldn't necessarily expect all social institutions to be, to be internally democratic. But I think it's a very, it's, it's, it's a very good way of, 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 of thinking, about, um, thinking about the... Um, uh, thinking about the problem. Um, uh, so I can only agree with you. Um, um, and class, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave. Um. Could, could I uh, try have a crack at the democracy question? Um, so for me, you know, uh, you know, being educated as a political scientist at, at UCL, um, one thing that always puzzled me in these kind of checklists for what is, the, what is democracy is the, the avoidance of the, of the word liberal, right? Um, it's, it's impossible to have, let's say, a democracy with a human rights regime and a bunch of judges that sometimes overall majorities without, without trying to make sense of that word. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm such a big fan of liberal democracy as an institution is that I think it, it provides us with a critique for things that are going wrong in our own society. So if you consider like uh, economic privatization as deeply uh, anti-democratic, both in its uh, rationale and its outcomes, um, I, I would say that this is very hard to justify in terms of the kind of essentially emancipatory logic of, of liberal democracy as a regime type 
as it's no doubt in democratic theory. Um, so, so I would argue that um, what we need to do, you know, we're, we're, we're probably not going to have two people here who have exactly the same conception of what democracy they, they want to see. Um, I think that we need to, um, at the same time as being uh, kind of empirical uh, data gatherers and being counters, we need to engage seriously with these normative questions of what we, what we understand by democracy in our research. Um, and yeah, the, you, you know, it was a long, long time ago. Um, I don't know, was it Esping Anderson or somebody of that generation? They said um, the, uh, the giant corporation fits oddly into democratic theory. Indeed, it does not fit. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, I, I think this kind of expansion of the democratic horizon, that's, that's how we got from, I think, having these uh, you know, botch job democracies that didn't have women voting and didn't have civil rights movements to where we are today. And I think that we haven't stopped moving. Um, so that, that, that would be my optimistic answer for this question of, of what is democracy. Um, I had a kind of follow-up on, on that. Um, so you um, talked about this dichotomy of uh, de-democratizing the economy while democratizing institutions. Um, and I think the two things should be looked at together, which was, was done, uh, I think, in the transition. So I'm not saying something new here, but the de-democratizing of the economy, if you want to put it that way, or at least the proposal of... Um, economic solutions that were to be taken up. Now, whether we agree or disagree with those, the idea that there was no discussion to be had about those is inherently anti-democratic. Um, they had effects on the institutions um, of democracy as well, or what fills those institutions. Right? So if you cannot debate uh, what democracy is for, um, so issues of redistribution cannot be debated, or that debate is restricted, uh, that has effects on, again, could be, could go back to your, you know, the, the transition, effects of the transition over those institutions is to restrict those debates later on or to transform those debates into something else. So in some countries, those debates uh, were, um, in a way, displaced by debates on ethnicity. And that kind of links to the issue of class. Uh, looking from the prism of my case, so Estonia and Latvia, it's not that class is not present, so it's not important. It is, but it's not... Uh, politicise as much as the ethnic issue. And in fact, every time uh, that cross-ethnic um, coalitions based on class um, emerge or start to emerge, uh, there is ethnic baiting. So 2011-12, there were big protests, uh, anti-Soviet protests in Latvia um, that saw Russian speakers and Latvia speakers protest together. Uh, and then, well, Ukraine happened. So made it very easy for um, nationalist parties to just say, oh, you see, uh, you try and uh, think about, you know, kind of building the social democratic project together, but in fact, you know, Russia is there and it's dangerous. And, um, so class can be easily uh, displaced in these debates. And I think we see it um, also um, in the West, if we want to kind of keep making this. So we get, get this um, fixation on migration at the same time in which um, inequality has been increasing massively. Um, that kind of displaces the discussion on redistribution and makes it into a discussion about uh, migrants, what sh do sh they should get or not get. We don't talk about class in the book. Um, we should probably, since we say that we should talk about power, but it doesn't come up, but I think I ever. suppose my, 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 my question kind of is, well, what do we mean by class? Yeah. Um, I kind of wonder if there's a kind of covert invitation to have a kind of more Marxist kind of perspective, which I could imagine, I mean, if you look at, say, the way uh, say civil society has been polarised and used as aspect of holding power in Hungary or Poland, then that I could that could kind of make sense. Um, so, but I think as you suggest, Lucia, actually class is is often tied up with kind of ethnic and national um, identities. If there's been small and medium sized kind of um, um, societies, so I, I, I sort of see that. I mean, you know, there's an invitation to have a kind of bigger bigger conversation but my, my comeback would be well class in, in, in what in what 
in what sense, economic capital, cultural capital, social capital, and, and, and so on. So, um. Um, so I actually will take a moment to say something about class because I heard a brilliant presentation last year by Gabor Shearing, who is mm. at Oxford or Cambridge? Is he in the States, I think. No, but yeah, I no, don't know. He yeah, moves around yeah. because he's, he's doing really great research on economic power in Hungary. And basically, the argument he made, which I found incredibly convincing and original at the same time, uh, was that Orban has basically harmed the interests of international capital while shoring up the interests of domestic capital. Because for those of us who are hungry watchers, it was very confusing to categorize Orban at first because he did these things that looked leftist, like something about banks, restricting banks. And, and then he's also very right-wing in other ways. Um, maybe I need to think more about this Galtan situation. But if you think that not all capitalists are equal, that some are domestic, and those are going to help you shore up your domestic power, so you want to help them out, and it's all these patronage networks at the end of the day, and those international ones you can just toss off unless you start making friends with China. Um, so I think we need to think about class in more nuanced ways. So not just <coughs> capital, but which kind, which kind of capital, a la sharing. The other is, of course, I'm going to invoke Tilly again. So in a book called Durable Inequality, Tilly was trying to deal with this. He was very troubled by this idea that class as a strata doesn't work very well. It's too rigid. Um, it's too structural. So he started thinking of it, of it in terms of networks, so, which fits very well into this patronage discussion and the Stark and Bruce idea that if you start to think of class in terms of networks and the holding of resources and passing along of resources, which is what he does in this book, Durable Inequality, you then see something that's also generalizable because um, after, in 1989, a lot of these places looked about the same in terms of the distribution of wealth. I would say uh, along the World Bank indicators, they, do the, they break things up by percentile and who owns what. I would submit now they probably look very different because there's been very different ways in which privatization has taken place, etc. But you could generalize on the basis of these networks and think about class in that way. Would you allow me a very short comment? Sure. I think, um, I think you might, if you haven't come across his work already, you might be interested in Thomas Zelitsky's work. And uh, he's based in Warsaw and he talks about uh, following um, world systems theory. Uh, kind of the idea for semi peripheral and peripheral uh, countries. And he, he talks about precisely what you're um, saying, it's kind of dovetailing between cultural um, and uh, economic uh, capital, the way this works in the East, in, in, in uh, Eastern Europe specifically, the, 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 the sort of um, importance of cultural capital in addition to the economic capital when, it, when we try to understand um, uh, power and um, class. So I'm thinking about class in Moldova and like the kind of the absence of articulation of class as that again as like a puzzle, and maybe the need to study like political generations and throw that into the mix as well. But I guess I don't know this idea of core periphery is such a political tool in Moldova as well, like the self peripheralization. Like we have no uh, internal agency because uh, there's either a Trojan horse from the east or the west, and it's really um, a strategy that elites use for this kind of stuff, right? Like this, this maintaining of hybrid regimes and this ebb and flow of democratization. So also kind of critiquing this self peripheralization and self disempowerment to this geopolitical narrative and really playing up this geopolitical narrative is a political strategy as well, as if Plahotniuk is on one side and his enemies on the other side. And actually the, the aggrandizement of one is kind of contributed to the aggrandizement of the other but to the external audience, it looks like there's a geopolitical cleavage. That, so I don't know, like the, the class thing is interesting. And then are oligarchs a class? Is this anti-oligarchic rhetoric a class narrative? But I don't think we need those frameworks necessarily get it. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> could, could I just add something? Uh, so there's, you know, there's kind of Fukuyamian argument, right? That, the who? Uh, Fukuyama. Oh. Uh, that, that when you have a, a big middle class, then, then you, you get a demand for democracy. Um, 
I, I don't think there's finance much support in the region, right? That, that, um, that there are lots of middle classes, uh, the ones, uh, if we categorize them as such, that, that are not necessarily demanding democracy right now. I, I suppose I, I wanted to ask you, based on what Sean said, you know, when Sean talks about um, uh, the way that we um, measure class, how would you see it? Well, my invitation was indeed a kind of a com convert, my, uh, yeah, invitation for a sort of a more Marxist lens um, on the, on the um, sort of, I suppose the, the the kind of landscape, the shifting landscape, the kind of new and old um, uh, cleavages that have emerged um, that you could see running along class uh, basis that mm -hmm. are obviously in relation to the new distribution of economic resources. I think, so I think one thing that emerges is that political actors can make and remake cleavages so they mm -hmm. can't just be read off economic um, structures. The other thing I was going to say is that to, tap, to go back to the thing about periphery, um, it occurs to me that actually some of this so-called backsliding can be read as another version of modernization. So one very interesting thing that, that I think people working on Hungary and Poland have pointed out, which I wasn't aware of before, is that there is a project of conservative modernization here, potentially. And that, that taps in with Andre Babich saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the country like a firm. And oligarchs, there's a, there's, I, I tried to read the comparative literature on oligarchs, and, I, and I, I couldn't really find that much, and especially there's no definition of how much you need to own if you're an oligarch. <laughs> so it varies from about a billion dollars to a mere 50 million. Um, the one thing that the literature does say is if you're an oligarch, don't go into politics. Don't, <laughs> don't, fund your, don't, don't front your own political party because you will, you will come under intense scrutiny, as indeed Andre Babish has, has found. He's in all kinds of uh, legal trouble. But what's interesting is the way that he projects himself, not as an oligarch, but as a national champion. Uh, his, his huge um, agro combinat, which, which, which sucks in all the uh, Czech EU subsidies, and, um, and, and, and the Czech government has naturally resisted any EU policy about directing EU agricultural subsidies to small and medium enterprises. And the rationale for this is it's in our national interest. It gener we, this firm generates employment. So this idea of the state as a firm, but also this, uh, of having this, kind of com uh, this conglomerate as a kind of national champion. And, and, it, and, and he very much is about modernization so if you if you read his book which is available in, in English sure there's a lot of populist stuff about getting rid of uh, you know countervailing institutions but most of it is all about um, solar power and smart motorways and e-government and an efficient state um, so 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 maybe we, you know there's there's literature there's a perspective we haven't looked at to think of backsliding as yet another inverted commas, another attempt at doing modernisation um, because the region hasn't really caught up with the West or it has caught up a bit but not, but not, not in a way that is sort of appreciated. Um, so, um, and the Marxist perspective, yeah, it would be, it would be interesting. I, it would be down my list of places to go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Carlos Gomez and I'm a student based here at UCLC's. I guess this is a question that is directed towards everyone in the panel. I want to ask the respective cases that you've been looking at along this road of democratic backsliding, if you've identified some crucial changes in the perception that both political elites and the general public have towards what the EU is, what the EU can offer, and what the EU should be. And now, because I'm studying a specific case, which is attitudes towards migration in the Czech Republic, I'm thinking about all these issues about migration, protection of borders, and so on. But it could be something related to the economic crisis, some sort of disappointment towards the, the role of what the EU should have been but couldn't, couldn't do for us. That's, that's a big question. I'm thinking about it. Okay. Other questions from people who haven't spoken up yet? Okay, go ahead, Adam. It's just um, a response to one of your many 
really good comments at the beginning, uh, Cheryl, was about this, um, you know, I saw putting all this in a kind of long durée of saying, well, you know, there were moments of, you, you, where, where do you trace, where do you, where do you trace this back to, um, particularly around a, a kind of um, discussion around populism? And we were both, um, uh, as um, the USA conference, um, where Vivian Schmidt gave um, uh, various plenaries and comments, but, but one of the distinctions she made was that this, and it's probably familiar with lots of people here, is the distinction between politics and policy. Um, and it struck me that actually many of the chapters in the contribution to the book actually speak to that as well. That, that, that is it about backsliding? Is it about policy backsliding? And I think there's lots and lots of evidence to say the unraveling, and from a kind of institutionalist perspective, yes, you've got policy backsliding. Um, but perhaps the problem is that, that that actually the politics was never that great, um, and and I think it, you know that's now. Perhaps what we're we're we're, we're focusing on, um, and, and we, we when the whole Europeanisation process was taking place, we could ignore the politics because we got swept up by the you know the opening and closing chapters and the um, what, what, what have you. So I, I just think that is a really interesting di- that, that could very well shape this kind of democratic backsliding uh, literature, and certainly it's something that that you definitely have in all of the chapters of the, of the book. Okay, that was a good comment. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyone else? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead. Oh yes, good. Hey. Um, hi. So I'm Nina. There's an author studying here at the Um And uh, I had a question on maybe the role of income inequalities, maybe in Poland, to explain the rise of players. Because you can see a lot of changes in the labor market. Um, for example, more and more uh, young people uh, get stuck in um, temporary jobs, and uh, they don't really have access to uh, open-ended contracts. And this could maybe uh, like, uh, be coherent with the rise, in, like with the changes in privileges, or is it only really uh, agency of political parties and political entrepreneurs that? Really create bridges and uh, so yeah, I had a question about that. Great. Okay, thank you. James looks like he wants to say something. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, I, uh, answering the, the last question, I think, uh, this is just based on things I've read. Um, it, it's interesting to see an analysis of. Um, how certain social democratic parties, and I use um, inverted commas, in Central and Eastern Europe, that their vote is held up higher than uh, those in Western Europe. And this is because uh, they've had policies that, at least within the bounds of uh, a usually ethnically defined nation, have have continued, like Smer in Slovakia. Um, So uh, could an argument be made that where these parties didn't really exist or didn't follow those parties, like in Poland, right, where the European, pro-European side of the politics was very economically liberal, um, th- this could feed the boost of um, a- an illiberal party. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, d- I don't know if, if I can hand it I mean, to somebody more. To the best of my knowledge, the law and justice base is disproportionately old and rural and poor, which um, which suggests that there's another there's another story there's another kind of story um, there. Um, it's very hard to unpick what comes from politicians and sort of what feeds up from the society. And obviously, there's this big debate in the populism literature, which is which is very sort of polarized. You know, saying, "Oh, it's the economy." No, it's culture, uh, and there's, I think there's a need to, as we were kind of suggesting in the question about class, there's a need to somehow marry these two in, into a much more coherent narrative. Can I answer Carlos's question as well, um, yeah. very super briefly? I don't think it's to do with the EU. I, 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 what I notice, I think, in the discourse of politicians, especially someone like Czechia, um, is that there's a West critical 
um, view. So once upon, and this is across the spectrum, it's not just on the right, it's not just the usual suspects. So once upon a time, it, we, it was all about we've got to emulate Europe, we've got to have these West European standards. Um, now, it's the, the idea is Western Europe is this dysfunctional model, at least uh, certainly culturally and certainly in terms of multiculturalism, which we've got to avoid. Okay. And it's very interesting that, that, that um, uh, if you, I mean, I'm interested in the sort of illiberal discourses on the central European left, uh, so I've been reading a lot of Milos Zeman recently, the Czech president. Mm. Milos Zeman is, is, is very interesting because he and others say, on the one hand, we've got to absolutely avoid being a multicultural society like the West. There are no go areas. It's dysfunctional. We don't want to do that. On the other hand, he says, we've got, we've got to be like... And, and Sweden is supposed to be this big example of a failed multicultural society. At the same time, he says, we've got to have Swedish-style economic... Uh, institutions. So I think that it's not about the EU, it's about this view of Western societies as a model, but also as a sort of warning to be avoided. So that's, that's and particularly in terms of multiculturalism. So I think that's the shift that's taken. And I, that's my view, not the EU, but a sort of the idea of the West as a model or a warning. And yeah, I would definitely agree with Sean about, about that. And I don't know whether Pete knows whether Russia is responsible for this, but definitely there were like, strong discourses coming from Russia um, about you know, gay rope and mm -hmm. things like that. But then we see picked up or replicated, mm -hmm. not only in the region, but I come from Italy, also in Italy. I'm not saying Russia is responsible, but definitely there was an appetite for this kind of looking at the West. There was the end for Italy looking at the north um, of Europe. That used to be what you should compare yourself with and always feel uh, worse than and always feel kind of like a like minor and kind of learning from and now looking at it from above and say they are mm -hmm. doomed and their societies are dysfunctional and they have yeah no go no so no go areas and so on um so definitely there is an appetite for this discourse and to me that links to uh, the question about the precariat and kind of class identity politics. I think, again, I agree with Sean that we've been too focused about saying whether, whether it's class or is identity and not looking at how this two intersect. And they intersect in many ways also because class in many countries is also defined, so socioeconomic status is also defined by ethnic status. Um, and the kind of claims also they're made on behalf of um, the population are coded in those ways, kind of using both. Um, so we shouldn't, as researchers, just pick one and then go with that, but look at the way, complex ways in which those intersect. And also something like the, 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 the dispute about uh, different qualities of food. Um, um, and in other words, economics as Central East Europeans, not just as, as sort of producers, or in, but but as consumers. I did think when I came across this, I thought, oh, you cannot be serious. This is ridiculous, talking about the quality of milk or chocolate, or um, I can't remember what the other one was. But actually, I think it is, it is something that offers us a, an insight into a sense of being uh, unequal, which is interestingly f focused through the economy, but it's also clearly about identity. Uh, How, who, are, who owns those companies? So, like, Poroshenko has a chocolate company in Ukraine, but, like... Uh, in Central Eastern Europe, how many companies have been bought up by Nestle and, mm. and blah, 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 and like all the water companies are owned by. So again, it's, is that really like a nationalist versus internationalist? But there's an underlying quite more serious aspect to this. Um, and I don't think this has decreased since I stopped doing as much field work, but people are very upset about, so in Slovakia, it was German drug companies buying up Slovakia Pharma, which was a pharmaceutical company, and then destroying it so they could sell drugs that were really expensive for Slovaks to buy. And then this was reflected in stories in Romania about power companies that were Western, buying up, you know, taking control of the power companies and then charging people prices they couldn't pay for. So this kind of narrative never got picked up enough. It got picked up in case studies. We did a special issue um, that came out in when was it, 2009, about sort of what happened, you know, 1989, and how do we think about it now? But this was never, 
one of the things that really disturbed me about trying to get that narrative out there 10 years ago was the neoliberal narrative didn't want to hear that kind of story because um, so I became sort of, I'm American anyway, we don't trust the EU. <laughs> now I suddenly love it. But, um, you know, it was, I was very skeptical about the EU. So first of all, going one of the benefits of aging is I can tell you in 2002, 2004, it was just strange to think the EU would suddenly grab all these countries and admit them. Why would they do that? So you could develop a conspiracy narrative, that is, they wanted cheap labor, they wanted to buy up factories and then sell more expensive things. And in essence, it's a hegemonic, almost 1930s style story about dominance. Um, and of course that was going to backlash eventually. Um, I don't know, it's just we never told those negative stories enough and now we act all surprised that these things are happening. Um, but I think those of us who are regional specialists, you know, I've started to reconsider things people told me 20 years ago, and a lot of the signs were there, right? We all are, a lot of people are nodding. Mm. So there, the negative story probably shouldn't be that much of a surprise, but now we need to really... But we have to be careful not to go on a kind of roller coaster ride of everything's, everything's awful now. No, we can that, be that, specific that's, that's, about that's, what's... We can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I guess there were stories that were happening at the same time yeah. so we shouldn't discount the story of the successful establishment mm. of democratic institutions mm. that in some of these countries were was unexpected that they would yeah. be built and would work and you would have you know competitive elections working and that being the rule of the game at the same time as there was economic exploitation there were other agendas um that were you know um the uses the root of enlargement to uh, be realized yeah. Um, I think, yeah, there had not been enough attention yeah. to those agendas, but there were also positive yeah. See, agendas. one thing I, I agree, I think one thing that occurs to me is that certain, certain periods need to be revisited, because the mm. backsliding debate tends to be a kind of current affairs-driven one, of, oh my God, Orban's doing this, and Babish has got a baseball cap, and he says he's to check Trump now. <laughs> so it tends to be driven by, you know, what's, what's happened, why has it happened, but it could be very useful to revisit a kind of earlier period... Um, so we've got this problem of a moving target. We're constantly trying to keep up with it. We're very current affairs driven. I just have a quick PS for Adam's Yeah, I, I, I also, Adam, can you expand a bit about the policy politics distinction, which I, which I now realise I possibly don't understand as well as I thought. I think it was just this point about, um, it was in some of the, uh, Schmidt's late recent stuff on, on Trump and Brexit and, and that actually trying to sort of understand the kind of populism or re reframe it in, in terms of, of, of a claiming of, of the shift from a, a previous period where it was all policy and no politics to a, to a, a, a current version of politics without any policy. Um, and actually that kind of equally, out, out of, equally problematic. Um, but it was sort of highlighting that period, which, I mean, she was talking particularly about... Um, I think she was talking particularly about the EU and the Europeanisation, but I think it, it, it does sort of capture some of the tension here between, you know, when we're talking about backsliding, you know, are we, we, we are really, or a lot of, in, in a lot of people's hands, it is about the unravelling of, of policy, of policy compliance. Um, and, you know, actually, that distinction, which of course we all know that the, the, the distinction is the, the tools of our, our trade, but actually it does it does help us clarify and demystify somewhat around, uh, you know, um, backsliding, because actually some of the politics that we're seeing, you can find in the, those of us who have been around a little bit longer, you know, they're there in the 1990s, they're there right from the beginning of the so-called democratisation, but we chose to, or scholars certain scholars chose to ignore them, mm. um, or see them as transitory, and that was the whole thing that we were. It, it was, there was a sense of, of movement towards a, a kind of, you know, utopian endpoint, and therefore the anti-Semitism, the anti-Roma, the, 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 the uh, you know, uh, attitudes of women, and what it was all sort of seen as something that would, would dissipate or, or, or disappear. But the politics were, were, was pretty unpleasant at times. Um, so I think it's about re reconnecting with that that dichotomy because I do I do think it sits very well with with many of the discussions in the in the, in the book.
Do you mean the difference between what you say, what you do, what you say you're going to do, and what you actually do? Is that kind of like the the bare bones of like policy versus politics, like the gap, or not? I think this is a pretty good summary. Can we stay with that? Yeah, and I wanted to give a very quick response on um, youth um, inequality and generations because a lot of you are younger than me, for example, and this is something, one of the reasons I had to completely redo my course is that for people who are you know, around 20 or in their 20s, things are terrible mm-hmm. in the West. And older generations have not been great at recognizing that in the West, and that's probably the same way in Poland. And to, this is like a ticking time bomb for everybody because you've got a lot of old folks making policy, making money, staying in these patronage networks. And what do we have in Eastern Europe that we don't have in the West? We have mass youth protests of different kinds. I mean, protest is a way of life now in a lot of these places. We just have these giant protests in Romania, Bulgaria. and. Um, People are just kind of acting like this is normal, routine politics. But this is a sign of a time bomb ready to explode. And the generational aspects and the inequality that youth are facing, debt, lack of jobs, lack of housing, um, that's the next thing we're going to you know, be at a round table and we'll say, wow, we really should have paid more attention to that. But do you, <laughs> think, it's, sorry. Do you, say, do you think it's like there's a positive story to protest? Like that people are... Sure. Like but they're, they're upset enough to protest. Effect. Like, if you think of Euromaidan, like, I mean, all of these things have completely changed the agenda. That's Even the true. climate protests in the UK, like, now we talk about climate catastrophe as a real thing. Like, I do, I do think it, like, has, there is some positive dimension of it. But will they overturn the patronage network in Albania? Possibly not, because, I mean, also, if we extend that demographic perspective, there's a very large older generation who are maybe not protesting, but maybe voting. I mean, the the, the youth are a declining group in most European societies. It's not like Egypt or somewhere like that. So although there are clearly, Hmm. you know... Demographic change, birth rates. I mean, mean, small groups can be mobilised. Groups which are squeezed and are declining can can mobilise. But my sense is that these protests that you see in the capitals of Romania, Slovakia as well, which are sort of often very urban... And they achieve a certain amount, but then there's an election and the governing party just gets back in on the back of votes from rural and small town locations. So, um, yeah. Okay, except for Kosovo, every country in, in the region is, uh, is an elderly country. Mm. And migration and lack of jobs doesn't make that yeah. story go away. Right. Yeah. I was about to say, kind of, there is maybe an, um, there is a positive side to the protests and the possibility of those protests being kind of uh, bring issues to the front, but then this division between generations is a little, there is an artificial part, so the, those youth, they have family um, so they will have parents and grandparents and they will end up reproducing uh, the same kind of networks so being, entering, some of them will enter the same kind of networks um, so it's not necessarily kind of where the generation becomes of age, then you'll see a change of the system because some of them will come of age mm-hmm. within existing networks of privileged yeah. power and so on and will have interest in replicating those. It's a bit sad to say, but it tends to happen that way. Oh. Um, yeah, and then immigration, like for, for the others, um, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, um, loads of people leave um, mm-hmm. of the generation of the 20s, the 30s. Uh, which might change the politics of other countries, uh, both against immigration or mm. eventually, you know, as we migrants get settled, we might bring in some new ideas or something mm-hmm. to new countries, who knows? Uh, <laughs> Two of us are migrants. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I noticed we have about four minutes left, and I think that's too few to do another round of <laughs> questions. So, unless can, anyone has any burning... Can we, can we yeah. just say that, although we'd be delighted if you went out and spent £100 on the book, or your library <laughs> did, obviously it, is a va- it was a special issue, and if, as I imagine most of you do have access to a university library, you can, you can download all the um, contributions. All right, well, thank you, everyone, and do join me in thanking the panellists for pushing, making this great book.